Professor Sri Raghavan, <coughs> Professor of Law, the University of Oklahoma College of Law. Welcome, Professor Raghavan. You may begin here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my job here is to really look at um, the intellectual property, particularly patent provisions in, in India, and to, and to highlight whether it's TRIPS compliant and whether, um, uh, uh, whether some of the charges against India are, are, are under, uh, with reference to the patent provisions are true. Right? So historically, if you look at India, India had a process patent regime until it was amended to confine to TRIPS. Even within the process patent regime, India had three requirements, novelty, utility, and non-obviousness. Even under the old regime, India examined the threshold question of whether something is patent eligible subject matter, which we call in the United States, as a threshold question after it looked, it looked at the question of non-obviousness. Section 25E and F of the previous 1970 patent regime, uh, the process patent regime, which really did affect the pharmaceutical industry, um, looked at non-obviousness first and then came uh, the question of um, uh, whether it's patent eligible subject matter. Section 3, which is now being contentious, is the new um, a threshold question uh, under the Indian Patents Act. And even before we get to Section 3, when India amended its Patent Act in 2005, it made sweeping changes. It established a due process. There is a, it established a new tribunal. There is a clear appellate process. The regional patent offices have been, uh, it, it established the regional patent office and <coughs> Uh, the regional patent offices have been modernized and there is a clear process for filing application and any denial of patents is because of the examination process. As many of us know, the non-obviousness question is a subjective determination in comparison to the prior art. So in comparison to the prior art, India has denied some patents, and that's not just patents of American or foreign companies, of Indian companies as well. Some patent applications have been denied protection. So that's through the examination uh, process. Now we come to the, uh, so India has traveled a long way from where it was before 2003. Um, and all of this is TRIPS compliant, and, uh, and uh, this establishes a fairly modern system. Now, if we come to Section 3D, right, true to its tradition, after looking at inventive step, whether an, an, a, a patent clears the inventive step, Section 3 comes into play in India. Section 3D, which is the controversial subsection, right, can be construed and is being construed as the equivalent of the threshold question in the United States, which is whether something is patent eligible in the United States. This test clarifies the test for determining non-obviousness. It's a refinement of patentability for a particular type of application. It is not a fourth requirement. It does not apply to all technologies. Indeed, it doesn't even apply to any particular technology. It only addresses one small question in a small subject matter. So it is not a fourth requirement. Um, and uh, it talks about a very small scenario. I do want to highlight, it's not alien for countries to have refined patentability guidelines. Uh, the best example I can give is the 2001 utility guidelines for biotechnology in the United States. It's a refined patentability guideline within the United States, much like Section 3D uh, in, the, in India. I also want to add that Section 3D does not exclude or discriminate against any particular technology because biotechnology patents are being regularly issued in India. Foreign companies have benefited from such patents and, and they, they are being issued. Now 3D draws a distinction between secondary patents and incremental innovations. While incremental innovations will clear the patentability threshold for showing enhanced efficacy, secondary patents, one that cannot clear the efficacy bar, will <coughs> fail the test of non-obviousness, uh, 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 test of Section 3D. So that's where Section 3D comes into play. It creates a bar between evergreening and incremental innovation. And I do want to add, 
this is a it, the, the part of the reason why India even instituted this requirement is because of the problems we in the United States face with secondary patents. Amy Kapsinski, Bhavan Sampat, I mean, I can give you numerous examples of academics as well as practitioners who write about secondary patents and the problems that's caused, they have caused in, in, you know, in this particular country. So it is to avoid the problem of, of secondary patents that's plaguing the United States and its patent regime that India has instituted the, uh, instituted uh, that secondary, uh, I'm sorry, India has instituted Section 3D. Right, with reference to the criteria itself, which is enhanced efficacy, which is the bar, it's kind of comparable to the Federal Circuit's own instituted standards in Pfizer v. Apotex of unexpected results. It is also codified in Section 2144.09 of the MPEP, which basically says if you're examining a chemical with similar structure, Right, with the difference in, in possible chemical properties, then we look at whether the, the application shows unexpected results. The unexpected or the surprising result is what, we, what, is, what in India is the enhanced efficacy uh, requirement. So to that extent, uh, I don't think Section 3D or Novartis in any way has discriminated, or the Novartis uh, judgment, I mean, has in any way discriminated against any particular or uh, foreign companies as a, as a class, right? Now, going on to the second question, which is with reference to compulsory license, uh, licensing in India. The World Bank statistics uh, shows that India's per capita income for 2011 is a thousand five hundred dollars, right? And it came down to fourteen ninety in twenty thirteen. In two thousand five, twenty five percent of the population earned less than a dollar a day in India, and Bayer's medication was priced at dollar five thousand. It's five thousand dollars a month to get Bayer's treatment, right? So the fact that Bayer has been compulsorily licensed affected absolutely no market because nobody could afford that market in India. So there has been no effect on the marketability of Bayer's drug, right? And that said, I do want to highlight, despite the exceptionally high pricing given the per capita income, Bayer's Nexavir is the only drug that's been subject to compulsory licensing in India. Uh, Pegasus, another very highly priced um, uh, had another very highly priced drug, and that's not been subject to compulsory licensing. Roche's drug, there was an application for compulsory licensing, and that was denied. Dastanet, another drug, which was not very highly priced, but nevertheless, uh, there was questions about its, uh, whether it, it catered to the market, uh, and, and compulsory license for that has also been denied. <coughs> so given that this is uh, the Bayer's case, uh, 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 I want to say is unique, but I do want to highlight the provision section 84 of Indian Patents Act is fully authorized by the, uh, the TRIPS agreement. The TRIPS agreement allows countries to establish a compulsory license regime in order to cater to public health requirements within the country. And section 84 is absolutely in compliance with that. It, it, the TRIPS agreement read with DOFA declaration and the later Article 31 base has all been, all of these negotiations were meant to help <coughs> developing countries like India and, and certainly uh, section 84 in India is not, uh, is not in any way violated of the trip, uh, TRIPS provision. Right. As far as the question of local requirements, the local working requirement, is India denying patents because they are not being worked uh, within India? Um, and, and the Bayer judgment is constantly cited for it. The Bayer judgment essentially said that it would be ideal if the patent is worked in India. But importation alone cannot be a ground to, to issue compulsory licensing. Right uh, to compulsorily license the patent. However, if imported, right, the licensor could show why it was not worked within India. So that's a you know it is not local working is not a red line for which compulsory licenses are being issued in India. And uh, and that's clearly from the IPAB. And I I, I absolutely want to highlight uh, that as well. Um, with that, I. Um, 
Um, I, I want to talk about the opposition procedure, the pre- and post-grant opposition procedure, about which uh, there, have, there has been some comments by members. The pre- and post-grant opposition mechanism has been important to take away one of the debilitating issues in India, which is the time it takes for, 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 for the court system to adjudicate a dispute. So the pre- and post-grant mechanism, it topples up, there are two specific opposition mechanisms, achieves something that the United States is now trying to achieve, which is public participation. These opposition mechanism has been instrumental in actually enabling the public to submit prior art and to participate in the patent system, which the USPTO is currently, um, currently working on. Um, and with that, I want to go to the question of agriculture, which is another question that's been uh, talked about. Um, and I, I, I just have a couple, want to say a couple sentences here. India, like other developing countries, um, took advantage of the flexibilities in Article 27.3 of TREPS, which basically mandates establishing a protection regime either by patents or by an effective sui generis system or by a combination of both. And India's system is an effective sui generis system. The effectiveness of such a system is usually measured by whether it caters <coughs> to national, socio-economic, and welfare needs. And from that measure, and that's the measure TRIPS Article 7 and 8 advocates, and that's the, uh, and that's the discussion under the TRIPS uh, agreement as well. So India's uh, um, uh, Plant Variety Protection and Farmers' Rights Act, it uses these flexibility and sets up a legislation which, uh, which is a sui generis system and makes use of the flexibility within that, uh, within that system. Finally, right, we're talking about India, which is possibly the only country in that region that is friendly to the United States. India is one of the few countries where amongst the public the United States continues to enjoy favorable and highly favorable reputation, right? So uh, it is one of the very few countries that, uh, you know, that, that enjoys very good bilateral trade with the United, trade, uh, United States as well. So it's very important to be careful and not have knee-jerk reactions in, uh, in trying to assess trade, um, uh, uh, trade policies of, uh, of India. And I do want, I do want to urge the, uh, the Commission to exercise caution here, and I do want to highlight that you, during the Clinton administration, we did something very similar against South Africa, despite South Africa repeatedly highlighting its public health crisis, and it backfired on the United States. And when it did, it, it looked, it, the United States had to completely, um, com completely um, change its position and give in to the original demands of South Africa. So it's important when we, when we take these measures to understand the ground realities, the welfare constraints, local economic circumstances, and then take a careful and cautious decision. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you.